this morning. I hope you'll be with me as we go through this. If you will, verse 1 uh, uses the word therefore, therefore. And how many of you have ever heard this? Whenever you come to the word therefore, you're supposed to ask, what's it therefore? Right? Have you ever heard that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a Bible teaching. When you see the word therefore, okay, what is he trying, where, where is he coming from in this? So he says that if there be therefore any consolation, then, and it kind of, I believe, goes back to chapter 1, verse 27. I put the verse up there. It says that I, Paul was writing to this church. He says that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul wanted them to have a, a single focus, if you will, as a church of what their responsibilities, what God had put them there to do, and they were to, they were to be focused on that, striving together, working together for the faith of the God. This is not a social club. That's right. That's right. Now, fortunately, we, get, we have friends and we have socials, okay? We might have an ice cream social this summer or something, you know, right? And get together and, and eat and have fun and laugh and talk and whatever. But, but that's not why the church is here. That's right. That's right. Amen. Okay. We we we've got a message that the world needs to hear. We're 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 to we're to uh, be taking that message to the whole world, but specifically to our own neighborhood, our own uh, neighbors and friends that live in our local community, but also to the world. So we're to have a single-minded focus on why we're here. How many of you agree with this statement that's up there on the board, the last point there? It says, a unified church is so much more effective than one that is divided. It's you true. believe that? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, you know, Satan's trick has always been to divide and conquer, and so he likes to put divisiveness inside of, of church families and and uh, and so forth. And then, uh, interestingly, the letter of the, to the Philippians is, is somewhat different than some of the other letters that Paul writes to the churches because of of the absence of a lot of major problems, it seems, in this particular assembly. This was a good church. It was a strong church. And uh, most of the other New Testament documents were written to address problems and so forth, like the book of First and Second Corinthians and so forth. But Philippians is unique because it's virtually problem-free, except there was one little problem going on he kind of touches on it. He kind of hits at it here. But over in chapter 4, he's going to name names. He's going to call out two women in the church who yeah. just couldn't get along. They were having an issue. They were, they were not seeing eye to eye. They, uh, they were at odds with one another. Selfishness, you see, had crept in. And, uh, and selfishness says, I want it done my way. Mm -hmm. And your selfishness says, no, I want it done my way. Right? And so we become at odds over things like that, things that can happen in the church. We don't know. We have no idea what the disagreement was about. Paul just said, you guys, you two need to get along for the sake of the gospel. You need to, you need to, to become unified and, and get along. So, uh, so God, listen, God knows that a unified church can be so much more effective when there's not disunity in it. By the way, the devil knows that if he can disrupt the unity in a church, he can stop That's right. That's the ministry right. That's right. of the church. That's exactly right. He can neutralize it. Now going back to verse 1, uh, past the word therefore, he, he, he lists four things, four truthful observations, I would call them, that uh, about their experience in church. And uh, I, I know there are, there are some, recently someone came out with a book, talked about some of the, the horrors of their church experience and you know telling about some of the bad things that happened to them in church and and uh, and frankly I've been around church long enough to know that it's not always great right and there are problems there are issues and and, and you probably have too but I can tell you my experience since I was 15 years of age is that church is the greatest place in the world Amen. I'd rather be in church than anywhere else now, I'm a huge football fan, baseball fan, whatever. I'd rather be in church than at a Bucks game or, or you know, a, a Rays game or anything else. Uh, I, I just think church is the greatest place in the world because of what I found, my experience. My experience with church has been good. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was in church for the first time that I felt truly loved and, and like I belonged. Are, are you... Are you Tracking with me here this morning, yes. okay? 
Yeah. And maybe you haven't always felt that way, and I'm sorry if that's your, not been your experience, but, but I was accepted at, you know, at, at, as a teenager into a, into a church youth group, and that, man, that was the greatest feeling in the world, I've, and I've been in church ever since because of the experiences that I've had. Paul lists four of those experiences. I'm going to give them to you this way. He says, since you've received encouragement from one another, and, and by the way, you say, well, it uses the word if, but yeah, it does. If there be any, isn't that the way it says in your Bible, yes. maybe? If there be any, it might say another version since. But, uh, but it's a conditional clause with a, with a yes answer, basically. If there, if there is not a, not a question mark, it's a, it's a sense. Since, yes. since you've received encouragement from one another in church. Have you ever done that? Have you ever yes. received encouragement from other believers? Uh, he said, since you've, you've known comfort from knowing God's love for you, has that ever brought you brought you comfort? Now, this kind of encouragement, this kind of comfort, and the second one that he uses uh, uh, is a specific kind of comfort. It's a spoken encouragement. It's a spoken encouragement uh, to us. But it even goes deeper than that. It's, it's as if God himself is coming to us at times and whispering in our ears. <laughs> uh, that he's saying, you can do it. You're, you're, you're going the right direction. This is the way, walking in it. It's that spoken encouragement that we get from the Lord. Sometimes it comes from the Word of God. Sometimes it might come from a message that we hear or a teaching that we're, that we're in or a Bible study that, that we're in uh, where, where we get this encouragement. It's like God is speaking to us. And then the third one, he says, since you've experienced fellowship, with, with the Holy Spirit and with each other, and hopefully you've experienced that. And, and since you've ke uh, felt cared for and valued and loved, then Paul, he, he's, he's making a case here. He said, I, I want you to do something for me. If you've ever felt those things, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I, my expectation for you is. And he, and he gives us that in the second verse, right? He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fulfill my joy. Make me happy, right? Here's what would make me happy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Like mind. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Um, and, but you know, that's what the church really is. It's, it's a place. Now, we come from various backgrounds. Uh, I'm from the South. How many of y'all are from the <coughs> North? Okay. Shame on y'all. No. <laughs> no. Uh, but we can get along in church, right? And 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 I I, I was born in the city, so we all were probably born in the in the in the, in the country, right? Yeah. We can get along, right? And and, and and in church, it's okay if you're black or you're white or you're or you're Hispanic or whatever. You can get along in the church, and that's why God made it work because we have the same belief. We. We, we follow the same God. We believe the same scriptures. We have the same Savior. We, you know, we, we've, we've been baptized and, and, uh, uh, and all the, those things kind of go together. And so the word like-minded there in verse 2 means to, to think the same thing, if you will. And then, uh, by the way, do you know this right thinking leads to right behavior? So we've got to get our thinking right before we can live right and do right and be right with what God wants us to do. So God said, he, he said, I want, you to, I want you to get on the same page. I want you to be like-minded, like-minded. And, and then he goes on to say, uh, uh, having the same, the same what? The same love. The same love. How important is that? Wow. How, how great is that? And the, there's three hallmarks here mentioned of being like-minded that, having the same love, meaning they would deepen the, in the love that they already shared together uh, in the Lord and in the church. And uh, by this you all may know that you're my disciples. <laughs> you have love one for another. That's the way our Savior said it. And then it says, be of one accord. One accord. And that word, that, that phrase, it actually means to be of one soul. We talk about, you know, uh, when you, when you find that person that you want to marry, that you want to become what they call soulmates, right? And, and that you, you, you have things, you're like-minded, you think about things in, the, in a similar way, and, and there's something about that. But, but we can have that in our relationships with others in the church. We can, we can have that being of one accord. 
And then again, of one mind, he says, oh, I don't know if you notice this, but like-minded of one mind, verse 3, it mentions mind. Verse 5, it mentions mind. Chapter 1, verse 27, mentions M-I-N-D. Um, Ten times in Philippians, the word mind is used. So obviously it's a key word in this little book, a major theme, because God knows that our right thinking leads to right behavior. Proverbs 23, 7, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And what we experience in life begins with our thoughts, does it not? Yeah. Thoughts become words. <laughs> words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits shape our character, and character determines our destiny, determines where we're going to go. So if your thinking is off, where are you going to end up? Okay. Not in a good place, right? we got to get this thinking thing right. Success and victory and Christ-likeness begin with our thoughts. What kind of thoughts are we to think and and uh, Philippians 4.8, of course, gives us that answer. We'll be studying that in a few weeks. And some of you know that verse because it tells us exactly what we're to be thinking about. Uh, right. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The problem is we fill our minds with garbage, mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, negative thoughts, uh, bad stuff. We let all kinds of stuff in our mind. We, have, we don't have much filter anymore of what we allow to come into our sight uh, or into our mind or into our ears or, or whatever, or uh, through the eye gate or ear gate or, you know, whatever it is. We, we, he says, you gotta, you got to be careful what you're thinking. So Paul says we are called to be like-minded in the fellowship of the church. And this means we are alike regarding our commitment to Christ and his word. This means we recognize that what we share together is, as recipients of God's grace is, is always greater than anything that might divide us. Now, being like-minded does not mean we all belong to the same political party, necessarily. It doesn't mean that we all make the same choices regarding, you know, issues of, of some issues of lifestyle and things, but rather we're to be like-minded regarding the core issues regarding to, uh, related to our faith. That's what he's talking about. Right. We're to be like-minded. I want to be in a church where people are like-minded, right? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, the call to selfishly serve others is found, begins or continues there in verse 3. In verse 3, let's read what it says. The call, the, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Did you get that? That's a command. Nothing in the church is to be done through these two things. So this is kind of a, that's the negative, right? Let nothing be done. He's to say this, this stops. There's some things that need to stop there. And, and he uses a couple of words. He says no no strife. What is strife? Well, here it's it's selfish ambition. Mm -hmm. it's, it's whenever we uh, put uh, our self, uh, uh, you know, in front of others, It carries the idea of quarreling, infighting. Uh, guess, guess what this word, this word was used in, in a political sense in the Greek world. It was used for what, they, uh, what we would call uh, uh, electioneering. You know what electioneering is? Mm -hmm. That's convincing people to vote for your side. I want you on my side. I want your vote. We hear that from politicians, right? We, that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're using this. They're saying, I, I am the best candidate. You know, I, I, but it, Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. We want our, a good candidate, right, that we can vote for. But, but listen, when you start in a church, you're saying, look, 
John, we're going to have a meeting next week. And they're going to bring up a motion at the church. And look, I need you on my side. Okay? Right? He doesn't even know what the motion's going to be. He doesn't even know what the issue is. But he likes me. We're friends. So I'm going to get him on my side. So regardless, if, uh, can that happen in church? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I want you on my side. And, and people take sides. And it ends up, uh, nothing's to be done through that kind of selfish ambition. Uh, it, it's, it, the attitude is this. My plans and ideas are better than yours. That, right? That's kind of the portrayal of this kind of person when they're, when they're in that kind of a mode. Selfish ambition there. Strife, causing strife. Uh, it, it, we're not to use flattery or false accusations or tac as tactics to advance ourselves. Then he uses another word there in verse uh, 3. It's uh, the word vainglory. It's an interesting word. It's, it simply means, uh, uh, well, what it says. Vain means empty. Glory means, you know, um, uh, to get praise on myself, right? And so it's, it's kind of empty praise, but it's vain conceit. The idea behind this is to have an overinflated self-image uh, of, of who I am and my importance. And uh, it's the only time this word's used in the Bible where it refers to a highly exaggerated view of oneself. And wherefore selfish ambition pursues personal goals at the expense of others, vainglory seeks personal glory, credit, and a claim. Here's their attitude. I'm better. I'm smarter. I'm more qualified than you are. So sometimes people can get off, off that attitude, right? I know more than you know. You know, I should be making that decision. I should have that place. I, I should be the person that you know is calling the shots about that. And nothing, he said, is to be done under those situations. We're talking about selfishness mm -hmm. and selflessness. This morning, the call to selfishly uh, or selflessly serve others. And what about the positive? Let's look at that real quickly. Um, it's also in verse 3. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So instead of selfish ambition, what we are to have here, we call it humility. Humility. Lowliness 